you know, I was talking with some of the other editors on the Marvel show. And I was like, we, we're not brain surgeons. Like we're not rocket scientists. Like everybody thinks like, oh, you're, you don't have to be smart to do this. And, you know, I don't think you need to be brilliant. I think you need to have good instincts, but you have to understand what people are going to understand. Like not only understand the material yourself and right. understand what the emotion and but you have to figure out what people are going to understand and what people are going to feel. Right. And, and there's psychology in it. There's comprehension. There's like just, you know, musicality, like all those things. You have to figure out how people are going to feel about something. And there's no other job where you have to do that. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Pete converses with a wide range of fellow directors, writers, actors, showrunners, producers, executives, and more on a journey to determine just what makes a good director and why we'll always need stories. Visit www.petechapman.com to get your official director's chair wear, hoodies, hats, jackets, mugs, and other swag, and learn more about your host. All right, people, welcome to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman, episode number 43, starring Shannon Baker Davis, the illustrious editor of television, film, and I'm sure many other things that, uh, uh, you know, maybe don't even get mentioned that maybe she did a web series. I don't know. Um, but here we go, y'all. Uh, I'm excited to share this interview with you. You'll find out that uh, the first thing that I ever, the first TV episode that I ever did was edited by Shannon, and uh, she's amazing. I learned in the course of our conversation that it was kind of earlier in her career as well, but uh, she was polished, she was sharp and creative and an amazing collaborator. So I'm uh, pleased to bring a conversation to you um, that's, you know, it's often director to director, but I really, uh, in this season, you'll find that we've got showrunners, we've got actor directors, um, we've got uh, actors, we've got editors. I really want to diversify uh, the information um, because there's a whole ecosystem of creativity in the world of film and TV. And the more you know about what each different department does and what each different position is uh, responsible for, the better you'll do in your respective craft. So that's the that of that. Um, for myself, before we dive in, I am in uh, the middle of shooting Interior Chinatown from the writer Charles Yu. Uh, it's a New York Times bestselling book, and uh, it's a it's probably probably one of the smartest shows I've I've been on. It's really created a an interesting world and analysis of uh, how Asian Americans are portrayed in media through a compelling procedural uh, canvas while examining uh, larger issues through, you know, comedy and drama. So uh, read the book, uh, Charles Yu, Interior Chinatown. It's dope. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'll see what is coming to Hulu sometime in the in the future. Um, we are on, but, well, by the time you hear this, I do these intros a little bit before um, the episode because uh, often I'm shooting, but I've wrapped three days. Uh, I've shot for three days of 10 uh, and uh, eight of 10 days are on location. So everything from uh, now until wrap will be on location. And I love it because locations are, uh, they're limiting in some sense because you have to deal with what you have available to you. You can't build it out to your specifications like you would have set, but you also, there's a reality, a grit and integrity um, and something that happens when you're on location, I think, for all parties that just makes it more real and grounded. So I am excited to dive into that. Um, what else do I have? I don't want to bore you. I don't want to delay you. Um, I figure we'll just get right into it. And uh, yeah, let's welcome Shannon Baker Davis to the podcast, y'all. Episode 43. Roll 
sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. So I just want everybody to know that it's 8.04 a.m. And we have the <laughs> pleasure of having Shannon Baker Davis with us at this time, where now I know that morning interviews, it's too bright in my window. I need a filter or some gels. But <laughs> yes, thank you for getting up before the work begins. What are you working on right now? Yes, I am on one of the Marvel streaming series. Ah, uh, you cannot say. <laughs> you can't say. <laughs> not yet, not yet, but it's exciting. Okay. Exciting. Okay. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on that. We'll get to how you got there because you've had a <laughs> pretty interesting journey going from at least career wise, right? From like assistant editor at working on a lot of kind of reality stuff and then mm-hmm. making the pivot, I believe, around the time of the good wife. Uh, mm-hmm. From my mm-hmm. from our research on you, but, yes. um, we will we'll get back to that. Just before we even get there, where are you from, and how do you get your your start? I am from Augusta, Georgia, and I did not grow up anywhere near like the industry, Hollywood. Didn't know anybody that was involved in in this, you know, type of business or work. Mm-hmm. And my mom is a nuclear chemist and my dad's a nuclear engineer. Wow. So I, you know, right around my junior or high school, I I was like, I want to work in television. And they were like, you can't make a living doing that. What are you going to do? How are you going to feed yourself? And I was like, well, I don't know, but that's what I want to do. Right. And And I like researched summer program and found this program at Northwestern in radio, TV, film. And I went between my junior year and my senior year and had the the time of my life and like knew like, this is what I wanted it. I didn't know that I wanted to edit or if I wanted to direct or write or whatever, but I just mm-hmm. knew that I wanted to do television and film. Was that program like designed to be a, a feeder program into the university? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, they're, they're called cherubs. You're called cherubs when you do it. And, and I wanted, I wanted to go to Northwestern. Like I was like dead set, like I want to go here. And they gave me like a little bit of scholarship money, but not like enough to cover the whole thing. And then uh, I had applied to Howard and Howard gave me like a full ride. And so my parents were like, you should go to Howard. Right. Here's why. (laughs) <laughs> but my, you know, my dad had also gone to North Carolina A and T, so they were right. big into HBCUs. And I was, I didn't want to go to Howard. I wanted to go to Northwestern. Right. And I remember, like, my senior. So I, so my parents convinced me to go to Howard. I was like, okay. And they were like, you don't like it, you can transfer. Like right. you. You know, and I didn't like DC for some reason. And you didn't I like that go go music. I didn't. I didn't. Not not in high school. <laughs> uh-huh. And I I cried driving out there, and uh, we you know went to like freshman week at Howard, fell in love, fell in love, and I went, and you know it was just I it really is the mecca like. It's where I learned about Blackness mm. all over the world. You know, mm. not in just not just my little town in Augusta, Georgia. I learned about all the different kinds of Black people that existed. And we are like very, as varied mm. as any other type of people, you know, and just met so many people and, and you know, learned to, to love Blackness, you know, right. and, you don't get that in high school in South in a lot right. of a lot definitely, of places. At all. Definitely not in Florida. Yeah, you don't get that, and uh, and I, you know, I, I, I just stayed in D.C. for the rest of my Howard. Like I got summer jobs and summer internships, and was just in D.C. and loved, it. love, love, loved it. Fell in love with go-go music. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now, did did your parents say I told you so? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, they knew I was happy and they, they were, they haven't said that yet, but Uh you know, like when you're in high school and college, you like, there's a, there's a corner you turn where you're, you start like listening to your parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that was the start of it. Okay. I think that was the start of it. Now I want to backtrack a little bit because you mentioned you were in your junior year and that's when you were like i i, I want to be in this industry mm-hmm. was it a film was it a t- what was the moment like how did you how did you um, arrive there yeah i i you know i didn't know what editing was like i just knew that i loved watching tv shows and you know we at the in the program we did we did it we did tracks we did it we we did everything we did television we did radio we did film Television was more like live studio production with the the big cameras that you roll around and the the, the board and the cutting cameras mm. live. Mm-hmm. And I really liked being the TD, the technical director. And that's the person who hits the buttons and says mm-hmm. camera one. You know, you have the director, but then you also have that person that's hidden actually the buttons to roll in the tape and all right. that. And I really liked that because it was it's like active. a symphony. Yeah, it was really active, and and I remember seeing Pulp Fiction when we were at Northwestern, and and that's when I realized that movies were cut together because uh-huh. it's out of border, mm-hmm. and it is, and it's like vignettes, but they all lead to one conclusion you know you you figure out how everyone is connected but it's 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 constructed in a way as opposed to a a movie that's a b c d and i remember just being like really really blown away by that movie and then you know i still didn't know that i wanted to edit but i just so was it the like really lack of a chronological linear aspect to the film that made it stand out for you that yes. you're like, oh, there's no way yes. that this is okay. Like this is purely yeah, a like piece you, of construction. That is where you you realize like, well, I, I at the we also shot did we shoot we shot a film and we cut it together too. Uh-huh. So and that was where I realized that you you cut things together. Like you you don't look at, People today still don't really understand what editing is. They're like, oh, no, you just shoot it the way it plays and you just take out the bad takes. You right. know, I think that's what people think that, right. that, you know, they don't know. You shoot it out of order or you shoot you based on location and you're, but not even that, that like when you get into the edit, you are recreating the story the best way it could be recreated. And this, all the possibilities that you have when you have all of your footage and you're just like cards, you put the cards on the wall and you're like, yeah. any scene can go anywhere. And Pulp Fiction was an example of that. Like any right. scene could get, could have gone anywhere and they made those choices. And and I, I don't know if I've never, I don't think I've ever read the script. So I don't know, or I definitely have never seen the original script. Right. But I imagine it's very different from what the movie looks like. Right. Yeah, that's a that's something that's they talk about that on the script notes podcast all the time. Mm. Like, you know, you you they a movie gets nominated and then they recreate the script to match what was yeah. edited. And so you don't often have the ability to look at what the actual intention yeah. was before the realities of production yeah. and, and creative yeah. epiphanies revealed themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, it, they don't often release those shooting scripts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they, sometimes they don't, they don't read well. Yeah. Well, more people would be, think they're better writers if they did. You know? <laughs> but then we'd have the, a flood of Hollywood people, as you know, <laughs> trying to get in the door. So, so when you get to Howard, what is the, what is the course of study for you? How do you now begin to go further down this rabbit hole of, I want to be in the industry. I'm not quite yet absolutely sure of what I want to do, but I'm going to immerse myself. Like, what did it look like for you during your time there? I majored in radio, TV, film, and I I minored in electronic studio art. That's what it was called at the time. It was like Mm -hmm. Photoshop and -hmm. and all of those programs. But I, you know, you do everything. It's a, a broad 
education of television, radio, television, and film. And I probably around my junior or senior year realized that the editing part was my favorite part of it because it's a, it's controlled. Right. Like you, and then when you're done with it, you have a finished product. And I was like into having my hand in whatever it was going to finished, the finished product was going to look like. And maybe it's a little controlling. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my part, the part of me that's like really like anal and, and likes details. And I'm super persistent about like making it clean and and perfect and that part of me like thrived in editing because you could you could just work and work and work until it it felt right right and on set that's you know there's a lot of factors that are happening and and you know there's the time element you're outside and and, you know whenever I was on set I was like this is great but (laughs) when are we actually gonna like like make it make the thing you know, I do, I do want to, this is a probably, I'm, I'm, I would have probably put this question in a later part of the conversation, but yeah. I, I, I often think, because on set there's more politics, right? And elements and all the other oh, things. Oh, yeah, like, politics. On, yeah, that's what, was, that's what I was going <laughs> to say. I wonder what it's like to be, I, I envision this scenario of the editor where they're like, they do their cut, you know, in, in a world where they have time to do their cut. It, it's, it's, it's a good representation of the show, you know, without taking a scalpel to it. Right. Yeah. So, the, so the director can work from it. And then you work with the director in the perfect world where it's somebody who's been hired and gets the show and does a good job. You start to find things in an artistic way. Mm-hmm. And then all, then you have all these subsequent cuts where like there are different interests. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, and I hate, I'm going to get kind of general, but like the director's going to try and make it artful, right? Mm-hmm. Then then perhaps the producers are going to, you know, know that, well, this actor's more popular. So like, let's get mm-hmm. more of that. For, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, then, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then the network's going to be like, yeah, but you know, this is what we're getting from the fans. And, 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 and you sit there each time almost as if you don't, already mm-hmm. know the answers because you've cut the shit out of this thing. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. you know what exists. You know that there is already this pre-cut version that does what yeah. everybody's saying. Like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Well, I mean, there's always something to be found in every iteration of the cut. Like when we do the editor's cut, I'm doing the best version of the script as is. Mm. And, and that is like the purest form of the script, but there's iterations that happen. The director is going to come in and, 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 and put their intention into it, you know, or like sometimes direct, it depends on if you're on a film or if you're on television, but directors, some tech directors like to play around and be like, oh, I think I might want to try this, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. You're very, very like you're moving so fast on set. A lot of times it's just get it in the can. Mm-hmm. And I like to think that when you come into the edit, you can hopefully push all that stuff that happened on set out and literally just see what's on the screen right. and judge it based on that. And then, you know, in television, after the director has their days and gets their cut together, the producers do come in and... Sometimes they want to they want to do their iteration of whatever it it is or whatever was originally intended mm-hmm. or whatever was found on set or whatever was not done. You know, uh-huh. like there's there's it it it's always you know they call it the third rewrite because you have what you have what's been shot and you are trying to present it in the the best way that it is like. Right. It's what it's shot now. It's not what the script was. Right. It's not what happened on set. It's literally just what's in the can and what's on the screen. And, it, you know, I do have, like, I like to think good instincts about things. You know, I like to think that I watch something. Of course, you've read the script, you know, several times before you get one day of footage. Mm-hmm. But I like to think that when 
and editor sees it and they don't know anything about what's happening, what's been happening, whose ideas are there, whose ideas right. are not there. All they know is like instinctually, did I like, did I like the way it was or did this performance move me? Did it make me cry? Did I laugh? Did, mm-hmm. That's all we know. And, you know, sometimes I say like editors, we work kind of in a minefield where we don't know all the things that have happened, all the politics, all the arguments that have happened. Like we don't, we're not a part of that. And it's great because we just look at what's there as opposed to, you know, the producer and the director, say you're on a film, the producer and the director of development and fought, fought tooth and nail over this one element, one person, one element. And they got on set and they didn't want to do it, but they did it anyway. <laughs> or that, you know, like they kind of half did it. And like, right. we don't know any of that stuff. Right. So we get like, sometimes you get into the, the cutting room and you're like, well, that's not, that wasn't a great idea. Or you don't say that, but like in your head, you're thinking, well, that, that didn't work. And you don't know whose idea that was. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you don't right. know like what, happens the conversation that happened around it and and sometimes it can be ex- it will be explained to you but I, I like to think hopefully that you know a director on a on a feature or a, a produ- writer producer or showrunner on a television show can try to see the you know the forest for the trees basically like you gotcha. they are like oh that's how you felt oh, it's funny that came up or I I thought that all along or, you know, it's just, it's a little bit of validation sometimes. Sometimes it's a come to Jesus, you know, like mm-hmm. it's, yeah, there's a lot of politics in the editing room for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, and so, and we'll come back to talking about- That was about, all like, over the place on that. But, <laughs> no, but, but see, but even, but even the answer is, is rife with politics, you know, like, the, I mean, the job itself and that a lot of what we end up talking about on the podcast is just that, like you, like there's, there's what I'll always say is like the best shot list can't be accomplished if you can't navigate the people, you know, and yeah, like, and for all, sure. the, all the like creative ideas on rhythm, pacing, music, segues, you know, sound bridges, uh, yeah, re- reframes here, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, if you can't navigate the people, it's like, it doesn't matter how, how talented you are because yeah. we're not painting or writing poems. So, so at, so at Howard that going back so that, what was there like a, do you leave with a particular like thesis project or like, how do you, how did, how did the program uh, prepare you to? Um, out? I, I did actually, like I never, no one ever asked me about that, but I, I was in, they had an, an Annenberg honor program. And so I was in that and we had to do a thesis project our senior year. And I did a document, like a documentary short mm-hmm. on how film shape our view of the police mm-hmm. and whether that is at the time, like a lot of the films showed police as like dumb and bumbling. And then, you know, like that's the different era. This was, this was, 20 years ago. So, and then I, you know, the, the, the idea that police were bad or good and did right. films shape that for us. And, and that was interesting. I cut that together. Like it was like on a VHS deck to deck using all these films like Die Hard. And cause I was like, a, I'm still a big action movie fan. Awesome. But yes, yeah, so I can't, I did that thesis film. I never did anything like that. I, I, I didn't know we didn't, I didn't have any access to like the world of mm. film. Like, no, I didn't, I had never been to a film festival. I didn't know anything about that stuff at all. Right. Right. But my right. senior, my senior year, okay, my senior year, Bill Duke was our dean mm-hmm. and he had gone to AFI as a director and, you know, like kind of as a second career after, you know, he's a you know, famous actor. And he was like, you, you like editing, you should look into the program at ASI. And I was like, what's that? You know? <laughs> and applied and got in and came out here and, and did that. And that was 
really where I learned what it is to be a filmmaker as opposed to like, you know, I had kind of, sometimes I have a gripe. I love Howard. I love HBCUs. But back in that day, I don't know how they are now. They didn't, they, they trained us to be good employees. Mm -hmm. They were like, learn how to wrangle this cable or learn how to like set up these lights and learn how to, you know, and then that's all Mm -hmm. very creative, but they were teaching you how to work for somebody. Mm. And I feel like at AFI, I got exposed to a lot of like rich kids that were always, that were always taught to do your, do you like work for yourself, like make your, make your own art. And, and that's where I really got like film education, film theory, like all of the, the like deep film knowledge. I had to, Mm -hmm. we, before you even start at AFI, you have to watch like this list of 150 films and, and read like 12 books. And and I, you know, I was at the, the, there was no Netflix. There was no like, (laughs) there was no like online streaming services. For that stuff, I had to go to the independent, not even Blockbuster. Blockbuster didn't have these movies. Right. The independent video rental store and rent the movies and and like go to the library and see if they had it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Uh, and just that exercise was also, it, they, I think they know that just that exercise puts you in the mindset of seeking knowledge about them. Right, right. Yeah, if that was for for those of us in New York, that was Kim's Underground Video. Yes, <laughs> that was the yes. only store. But it's interesting though, right? Because there's like there's something great about both parts of that education. Because like mm-hmm. you know, as somebody who went to film school at NYU, I felt like you know there was like okay, find your art and you'll be a storyteller. Yeah, and then like. I remember going out and being on a set and 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 not having any clue what set protocols were. Yeah. And so I was like, so well, it is cool like to be out here, yeah, blah, 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 and making fingers yeah, like yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. Or like <laughs> well, when when they said, you know, grab the duvetine or like, you know, this is the order of how we move through the day, like I was like, oh, really? And you know, it's like finding a way to get all that information, but it's also it's also tough because I, I think when they're young and you're trying to like, you know, educate young, younger artists as to what they're stepping into, you also can't teach them everything. It's almost like religion, right? Like you can't have yeah. a complex conversation about religion with a, with a younger person. You're just like, you go into church, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> and then later on, we'll have a, a deeper conversation about it. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's the difference in the kind of, I guess spirit of the education, right? Like, what do you leave AFI with as an editor? Oh, my God. I, we, we edited like we were, were, like it was a job. Like, (laughs) we did 12-hour days. We did sometimes six, six six-day weeks. We, the first year, you cut six short films. Mm -hmm. The second year, you cut two thesis films. And so, it was just, like, intense editing and what they do which was my favorite part is they body who cuts a short like there's a we do they do a cycle project so like every six weeks or so you're working on a different short film but right. every film that is done come they bring their script into the editing class, right and the editing class reads the script and is responsible for talking about the editing of it, like, you know, transitions and time, time and place. Like, how are you going to, how are you going to establish these things? But it always ends up being about story. Mm -hmm. It always ends up being like plot, things that are, are not continuous, like character that doesn't feel continuous, like, it always ended up being a like intense story conversation and, and at the script stage. So we were like literally editing it in our head mm-hmm. before anything was shot or I was. 
because you picture, you read the script and you picture it and you think, oh, this, this is an emotional moment. This is where you would see a close up or, you know, this is where you would want to see what the other person is thinking. And you're like, mm-hmm. you're doing that in your head while you're reading the script. And so then it tur- it it becomes our education about just story, just right. hard story. Because also this is, you know, grad school, like these scripts are bad. They're not good. So it's like a good, it's a great just education. So that was the, in our, you know, our editing professors were like working professionals too, like Beryl Levy, Howard Smith, Stan right. South as my professors. And they, you know, Howard Smith, you know, cut, they cut everything, everything. Right. And and then they brought like professional editors in, you know, and, and we did these like seminars with the whole, the whole school, the whole class and just expo- getting exposed to all of those different, like I, I had come from like never being able to see anything like that. And that was just really great. They did some stuff at Howard. Like I'm not right. going to like knock the Howard experience, but it was, you know, you were in the middle of Hollywood. So literally in the middle of Hollywood. So you got that. Were you on Avid? Were you on Premiere? Yes. Were you on Steambeck? Like, how are you? We were on Premier? Avid. You had to know Avid before you, you had to have, like, learned how to use Avid before you came to AFI or some kind of nonlinear mm-hmm. platform. Like, some people knew Flat Final Cut and, you know, you just had yeah. to translate that into Avid. And we did, like, an Avid intensive the first two weeks. So just to right. make sure everybody knew what they were doing. And I had learned, I had had a job for a year after Howard. And that's where I learned how to use Avid. It was at a political commercial. And so I was doing a lot of, I was an assistant editor and like, and they also did like those time life commercials that you see. Uh-huh. I don't even uh-huh. know if they, they have those anymore, but they were doing those time life commercials. And so that's where I learned how to use Avid. And there was a lot of like graphics and, you know, especially political ads, you know, they have like the graphics and the, and the the blurry and the slow mo, there's a lot of effects being done in those. Right. I learned I learned a lot about how to and know, that and at the that Georgetown time, post. Yeah, yeah, and and at that time, that was not as easily accomplished as it is now. No, I mean it. It it there was a lot of uh, render time, mm-hmm. like you. Mm-hmm. It was still a still nonlinear, but it's still digital. But like it took so long to write. I remember my first job in New York after I finished AFI. I was on the show called Celebrity Poker Showdown. And there's tons of effects, like layers and layers and layers of effects in your timeline, boxes flying all over the place and, you know, all kinds of things that we were doing. But you had to like put it together and know what it was going to look like and kind of like step through it frame by frame. Because once you hit render... You were like waiting like five minutes to see what it looked like. And I used to, I used to have a book and I used to like cut it together and step through and say, okay, I think that's going to work. Hit render, pull out my book, read, wait uh-huh. for it to finish. And then go, I mean, now that stuff is like instant. All that right, time. right, right. Or you don't even have to render it. it it's real time. Like it, there is no rendering. Right. So the, compu- the computing caught up to the. To oh, the yeah. Ends. Oh, yeah. I was like my first assistant editing job. I was feeding beta tapes into a tape deck. So we, mm-hmm. there was no, yeah, we sat around and waited. If it was, it was, it was a poker show, like a poker game with celebrities. They had 16 cameras. They, you know, shot for two hours on right. one poker match or maybe longer. Right. So we had a tape in and you sat there and watched it for two hours. You didn't, there was nothing else to do. <laughs> Man, then I'm looking at beta SP tapes of my feature right here. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I probably find them somewhere in a box. Getting it's like, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with them. We, had um, beta t- we did beta at, at AFI too. So. So that's a, so you brought us to, so you go from AFI, you go from LA to New York and you start yeah. working as an assistant editor in, in primarily reality. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. was, how did you land that job? Did AFI help you land that job? You know, and, and not maybe specifically, but like the fact that you had now had this quote unquote pedigree and like, what was your life like in reality? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I, outside of 
LA. <laughs> I don't know that they probably meant anything to people. Maybe it did. I I hated LA. Like I did not like LA. So I wanted to get up out of LA as soon as I could. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I moved to New I moved to DC for a year and then I moved to New York. And don't remember how I got the job in DC, like Mandy.com, like some form <laughs> one. It was some random yeah. A show called Dream House. And it was a, a, a reality show about a man who was building his dream house. It was on HDTV. Mm-hmm. And I was an assistant. And I remember, and I, you know, I could cut, I could cut. Like I knew I'd been in AFI. I was like, I can cut. But I was an assistant. And I remember they were like, Oh, you cut? Like, do you want to do these like packages? And it'd be like, Oh, we're at Home Depot and these paints are, we love these paints. It'd be like a pan of the paint and right. somebody like stirring the paint. And they were like, right. can you like put these, can you, do you think you could do that? You Could you put that together? And I was like, yeah, and I did it. And they were like, so amazed. <laughs> I right. Put that together. She's and got a future. They were like, wow. Oh my God, <laughs> you really? And I was like, yeah, no. But that is a little bit of like, you know, like people, I still to this day walk into a room and have to prove that I know what I'm doing, like, even to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, How do you feel that? Is it by the questions that people ask you? Is it by the vibes that they give? Like, um, how do you? I think that like any any job, like we, you you walk into the space or, I, you know, we walk into the space. I don't know how other people move through spaces but you we walk into the space and you have to build trust so you have to I speak up about you know issues that I see issues that I see coming and and they have they have to trust that what you're saying is actually true because Mm -hmm. when you're an editor that is the end of the line so there are no more there, you know, you're going to do screenings and people are going to watch it and you're going to get all these opinions, but it's kind of like the, the finish line that you're marching towards and they, they have to like trust you, trust that right. what you say is, is right or right for the film or, you know, and, and I, you know, like my reality days, oh my God. Like, because nobody knows what that's going to look like. Like you, in the beginning, they just shot for hours and hours and hours. And then you got in the room and you put that story together. Now they kind of shoot to story and they, they map out what they're going to do and what they're, what they're going to say sometimes. And like, like, why are they're not actors? (laughs) And so a lot of times you were trying to like make people feel like they were really doing these things. But in the beginning, they just shot and shot and shot and had to figure out that story. and. Because I had gone to AFI and done that education in story, 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 character, 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 I was really good at putting those things together. Mm. And like also like watching it and understanding what was missing or what you what you couldn't understand or, you know, like, you know, sometimes in reality, you'll you'll get a they'll just do like, they'll do a dinner and it'll be a four hour dinner and they talk about everything under the sun. Right. And a lot of that was like figuring out, well, what are we focused on in this episode? What's going to make this episode, what's going to make these characters feel continuous, feel like they have an arc. Right. And I would, sometimes I would suggest things with all the people, you know, and, uh, you know, like all everybody talking about everything and I would suggest things and they'd be like, mm, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then somebody uh-huh. that does not look like me would say the exact same thing and they'd be like, let's do that. Right. right. Like that, I had that happen, but, you know, more In times. Numerous than, times. Yeah, because it's, they, you know, just don't think that I knew what I was doing. Right. Right. Bottom line. Uh, but yeah, yeah. look, I, I know all about that. You know, yeah. there's, there's a certain amount of, you know, as someone who's also hopped on a variety of different shows, mm-hmm. you know, there's the, the place where you show up and it's like, okay, like 
we know you got this. And then there's yeah. the place where at this point too, where it's like, now I've done enough different things for you to know I've got this. Yeah. But you can still tell that they don't quite know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, and and it's and it's not it's not the same. You yeah. Know, for everybody. Yeah. Um, but well, that's what about, like there, you know, there I think it's the it there's a sensitivity, like we take somebody's baby and we raise it. You know? <laughs> like mm -hmm. and you know, I've I'm always I've always been like that kind of nurturer kind of person. So I try to understand where people are coming from and understand like what has happened to them and how they got into this place. And, right. and, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes you, you, you want to know that, but then you're like, okay, I don't, now we need to get to work. So right. Right. Uh, let's get to work. This is Valerie Weiss, director of Mixtape and Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and you're listening to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weasley Productions. What started in 1993 has been a marathon of persistence and creative pivots, transitioning from indie filmmaker to teaching at NYU's acclaimed film school, to running a production company, to directing television and commercials, and ultimately eyeing a return to the feature films that gave him a start. A mixture of how-to, self-help, and inspiration. This book is for any person targeting a successful career in the creative arts. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook from Michael Weezy Productions is available on Amazon and anywhere else you get your books. Don't forget about your local mom and pop shops, people. What does the assistant editor do? So then we and, can talk when we talk about the editor, like we have like like we got a better idea of right. like that kind of progression. Right. So, so in re, in reality or just in general? Let's let's go to let's go to scripted because your your right. job on a good wife, your first scripted yeah. job was as yeah. an assistant editor, first, right? It was as an assistant. I edited for 10 years and then moved to LA and edited some more reality shows and Finally, I, we had our daughter and my friends that had been trying to get their feature film, scripted feature film together, finally got the money together. And they're like, we're going to shoot. We want you to, we, I had been talking about editing it for years. We want you to edit it. We're ready to go. And I was like, three months, like the, our baby was three months. And I was like, I should do this. I should do this. Like, mm. I've, I've been, you know, it was a good time because I hadn't said yes to a next job. Right. And loved it. Loved, loved, loved cutting the feature. And I was like, this is, this is it. Like, right, <laughs> that, right. Was, that was cool, but this is it. And I did like a couple more reality jobs after that feature locked because I had to, that I got paid no money to do that. So I had to of like course. make money again. And I had been offered the baby. And so I was like, I had to make money. And I was so miserable. Like, I was like, oh, it's, it's like that you go to, you know, you go to Hawaii and that, that first couple of days you're back home. You're like, what is it like? This right. is like, this ain't it. How did I ever live here? You know, like, how, like <laughs> how was I doing this? And I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, if I'm going to be away from my family 10, 12 hours a day. It better be doing something that I love. Mm. So the end of that year, I was like, don't take any more reality jobs. And it was hard because I was like moving up and making more and more mm -hmm. money and, mm -hmm. and getting to choose projects that I wanted to work on. And I had to say no. I'd be like, no, I'm trying to do this now. You know, I'm going to try it for six months. I'm going to try it. And I didn't work. Right. And I finally, I met Katie Skirping, who had gone to AFI. And she had a little girl that was the same age as Savannah. And they were like three weeks apart in age. Wow. And she was like, I'm looking for an assistant on The Good Wife. She had been she had been the assistant for like six seasons and she was getting bumped up to editor. Okay. And she was like, I love you, but they're not going to let me hire you. She was like, I can't, they, I'm trying, but they won't let me because you don't have any experience and they, they, they want somebody with experience. 
And I was like, okay, okay. You know, like, but I really like you. Like, let's just hang out and let's just do things. And we did things. And then I kept in touch with her. And, and, and I think it was like a, like a month before she was like, I might be able to get you in here. And I'm like, okay, just let me know. I'm sitting at home. I'm ready. And there was a Friday and she was like, what are you doing? And I was like, wait for you to call me. (laughs) <laughs> okay, can you come Monday and start? She's like, I am having to let go my assistant. And I told them I want to hire you this time. And mm-hmm. they said, and her, she's going to kill me, but her post, her, one of her people, I mean, what it was, was like, fine, you can hire Shannon, but it'll be your funeral. Hmm. And Katie said, she, and I told Katie, I was like, I'm not going to let you die. Mm. And oh, like, it makes me tear up. Because This is awesome, though. They yeah, she, she took a chance. And she was like, I, she was like, I was an assistant for six years. I could tell you everything you need to know about cutting this show. Like, right. you're, I mean, being an assistant editor on this show, you're fine. You, you went to AFI. You are, you seem like you're a fast learner. Like, you were an editor. Like, you, you got, right. you know, right. and people right. made it seem so hard that you could be doing one thing and like figure out how to do something adjacent to that. Like they right. really made it seem like, oh, it's impossible. Like, I, right. what will I do if I have, oh, I won't even know. Like I'll have to do my job and your job. I don't know. And it was like very, very dramatic <laughs> yeah. to get a job in scripted. And then, Is there any portion of that? Were they aware I'm going to assume they were aware of who you were and that you were a Black woman. Was that a part of it? Probably, maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, they probably didn't have when that was, that was what, like six years ago, eight years ago, this is mm-hmm. 2016. So there weren't a lot of Black women doing yeah. it. Editing, mm-hmm. assistant editing. There weren't a lot of people that were not doing it already doing it. Like they didn't let people in. New people didn't, didn't get in. Right. right. Like if your dad was an editor and you were like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of fell into it. Or you know, there was a lot of those stories or, right. you know, you came out of USC or you came out of UCLA. You were, well, they, they have that network. And, and AFI had a network too, obviously, because Katie had gone to AFI. But it was just really hard. When I, when I gra- first graduated from AFI in 2003, there were no jobs. Like there were no jobs. There, uh, you know, for someone trying to enter the game and and start anew with yeah, with no yeah. connections. There right. were there. It was just yeah. I I don't even know that there were a couple of people that came out of editing that like worked with the director at AFI, and that director happened to like blow up right. and they, right. they had jobs, but right. that was so rare. Most people were working in reality TV. Yeah. So, so, so what do you do when you, you're in that job? They think it's going to be her funeral, but it obviously was not like mm-hmm. day to day. What do you do? Like, dailies oh, what, come okay. in. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. What's the yeah. responsibility? So the dailies come in and you organize the dailies. You check the dailies against the camera reports. Mm-hmm. You, you're essentially feeding, speed watching through. Like I, I would speed watch through. I don't, if you got a lot of days you couldn't do, but just to make sure everything was okay. And, and I was just interested in like what was going on, like what she was about to cut. So I was like, you know, trying to do as much as I could. And then you hand over, you know, your daily bids to your editor. And then after that, you are taking that scene that they. So are you, are you thinking, are you having to sync things? No, I mean, there are places where the assistant editors are processing dailies, but for the most part, a lab does that. A lab sends you an avid bin and media and you're linking that, that stuff that's already been processed, been synced together. It has been, you're, the assistant editor is grouping shots together. So if they shoot, more than one camera, the editor wants all of those things to be able to play at the same time. So you're grouping those mm. things together. And, you know, there are occasions where you'll get a shot, and this is part of checking the dailies, where it's out of sync. So you you 
go back in and you resync it and make sure and sync. And then you're turning that bin over to your editor and then your editor cuts it together and then they give it back to you and you do the sound design. You do any like temp prompts and in TV screens, like when they shoot, I mean, you know this, but like for the people that don't know, when they shoot a TV screen, there's nothing in that screen. So you got to put something in that screen. And sometimes the assistant editor, always the assistant editor is putting whatever it is in that screen and, or in that phone, you know, when people look at their phone, there's nothing there when you shoot it. Right. Is it, um, is it super time consuming? Like, like, is it the kind of thing where like you have so much footage coming in that it's like, I hope I, like I'm, I'm trying to stay ahead of the incoming or. Do yeah. You- I mean, for, it, yeah, you're, you're trying to, you're also, you're trying to like keep up with the editor. So the editor is trying to keep up with what's being shot every day. So every day you're trying to stay up the camera. So when they shoot something on Monday, you get that footage on Tuesday. Hopefully you've had it cut together by the end of Tuesday. So that when Tuesday's footage comes in, you can start on that on Wednesday. And you're trying to stay up the camera. So the assistant editor is trying to stay up with the editor. And I I mean, I when I was started out assisting, I had been an editor for so long. I was like, I don't, I just need to know what I need to do to take care of my editor. Like, that's all I had. And people were like, oh, was it hard going back to assisting? I was like, no, it was, I was out of the hot seat. Like I was out of the seat where you had to have all the ideas and all the fixes. And, you know, that's the editor's chair, like where you need to know what's right. You need to know what's best. And I was out of that seat for a little while. And I was like, I, all I had to do is take care of one person. I got this, you know, like I got my lift and. You get through my list and, and, you know, you know, you're doing turnovers and turnovers are after the, the picture is locked. You're gathering all of the, the edited sequence and sending it to vendors for sound, for music, for final picture, like onlining and, Mm -hmm. and the DI, which is where they do color and, and yeah, assistants do a lot of work. A lot of work. And then, you know, then there's the added element of if you're on a VFX show, you have VFX editors that are right. turning over shots to the VFX vendors and turning over like at Marvel, we do we do what's called previs, which is before mm-hmm. anything is shot. It's like an animated version of the sequence. And then we do post it. So this footage comes in, it gets cut together and we send it to a company that does another animated version of the effects. Right. With the the footage that's actually been shot. So, and that's before we send it to the effects. That is just to have a working version of, of right. the, the, the film or the show. Yeah, it's. I just did that for really the first time on this show, Dead Boy Detectives. And okay. it was like, you know, it, just the amount of things that had to be so predetermined. How many yeah. times are you going to cut to this shot? Yeah. Because that is $22,000 every yeah. shot. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it, and it, it's budget. so yeah. So specific. Yeah. So how did, how did that prepare you for your editing job in the narrative space, having done that mm-hmm. assistant editing work? Because by the uh, time I met you, and in, in, I guess that was uh, the fall of 17, you know, yeah. seemed like you had been in that chair for years. Yeah. Not, not, not. Well, I mean, I, I, I started on The Good Wife in 2016. And then by the end of 2016, I was editing again. I was, I got, I talked myself into this job, talked my way into this job on the quad for BT because it was about a Black college was about a band in a black mm-hmm. college and I was a, a dancer. <laughs> so I was like, I know this world. And I was like, yeah, this is me. This is me. And a woman named Felicia Henderson also took a chance on me. Mm-hmm. And she was like, she I actually, she was like, I'm going to hire you. Can I'll, you're going to be an editor, but first let, can you assist for a couple of weeks or, you know, just so you can get in there and then we'll transition you to editing when Mm -hmm. your episode comes up. And I was like, okay, great. This is this, yes. Um, And I think my, 
of course, AFI prepared me for that because AFI prepared me for knowing story to do reality shows. And then mm-hmm. reality shows prepared me a lot for working in scripted. A right. lot, a lot. Because it's it, in reality, you are shaping the story so much so that like you're reshaping the story a lot of the times. And, and so I had this mindset that like, well, what is the best story? Like this is, right. you know, this is it, but what's, what's even better than this? And, and so that like that, that's how I feel like my sense of structure and my sense of pacing and mm-hmm. comedy and all those things. Cause like I, in reality, we had to create all that stuff. They, right. they saw stuff that was not funny. And they're right. like, yeah, you know, <laughs> we want this scene to be funny now. And you're right. like, what? They're fighting. Like, right. you know what I mean? You want me to make it seem like it's a joke now right. or like that it's, that it's comedy. And they're it like, sound, yeah. it sounds like that that puts you in a into a a repetition of going through all of the available tools mm-hmm. uh, to make a scene work, right? Because like absolutely, like I feel like as a director too, it's like uh, sometimes I'll be like, well, you know, like I've had people shadow me, and I'll, I just mm-hmm. inter- interrogate them, and I'd be like, yeah. okay, well. You, you couldn't do the shot, let's say, that you wanted for a particular reason. What else can you do? But you yeah. can do something with sound. You can yeah. do something with, you can take something yeah. away and, and you can accomplish what you want. Yeah. You know, there's the ideal way, but you've got like this toolkit of like at least eight to 10 things that, you know. Sometimes it's better. It yeah. It's yeah. better. And your varied work is probably like, oh, let me go back to that that thing that I know I can do in these moments. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you do you know the story of Jaws and how the the shark and Jaws the shark didn't work? It, it, yeah. it didn't work. It it always broke down. It looked ridiculous, and so they were like, "Well, we'll just use this sound, Donna, Donna, and that will <laughs> represent the shark, and people will lose their shit when they hear right. that sound." And it it's like iconic. Everybody <laughs> knows what the sound of a shark is. I think it, <laughs> I think Donna, it worked out. Donna. <laughs> that guy, John Williams and Spielberg. I don't know. Yeah, Spielberg and Michael Features. Kahn. Yeah. Michael Kahn was the editor. Um, uh, yeah, that's so, that's dope though. Those, those solutions are what make you like really good at your job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, try to be, you know, like writing, like we write ADR on, on, and and that's just like reality. Just like when we, we just have to, we just have to write with words that already shot. Right, because they weren't actors and they couldn't pull it off. But then also, like, and you know, I was talking with some of the other editors on the Marvel show, and I was like, "We, we're not brain surgeons. Like, we're not rocket scientists. Like, mm-hmm. everybody thinks like, oh, you're, you don't have to be smart to do this. And you know, I don't think you need to be brilliant. I think you need to have good instincts, but you have to understand what people are going to understand." Like not only understand the material in yourself and right. understand what the emotion and but you have to figure out what people are going to understand and what people are going to feel. Right. And, and there's psychology in it. There's comprehension. There's like just, you know, musicality, like all those things. You have to figure out how people are going to feel about something. And there's no other job where you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so true. You have to you have to be in tune with all of those mm-hmm. things at a heightened mm-hmm. level, yeah. in a in a predictive way. Yes, yes. So I love to ask experts at their craft, like you know, this is almost kind of specifically a for either people who want to edit, but also b for directors. Like, what are the things that you see directors do that are I don't know top three mistakes or things that they could do better in in all right let me let me split this up because <laughs> <laughs> there's, wait, there's so many be in trouble but, but like okay things that you you feel well okay I, I was gonna I was gonna carve it out and be like all right things that you feel like when you get footage you're like oh that could have been better 
accomplished with prep. But mm-hmm. then I feel like that might be too, like, you know, hard to answer. So yeah. maybe we just leave it to like, you get the footage and you're working with the director. You know, yeah. what are what are three signs of someone who, who knows what they're yeah. doing and three signs of someone who like, perhaps should refine what they're doing? I mean, I think there's a lot of like creativity that I see a lot of the time, you know, say like, for instance, a director wants to do a one and, and you're like, okay, great. Love, love that idea. <laughs> but you have to have a sense of the pacing on set in the moment and whatever it, it is you have to do, like watching other oneers to see, well, how fast did it move? How slow did it move? Where was the camera when? Like it, it seems so simple, but mm-hmm. I think some directors get on set and, you know, like whatever happens, like in their mind, they have this great the idea for this oneer, but, you know, now there's a lamp that's like going to be covering somebody's face. And, you know, you, there, there's things that happen there. And, but essentially, if you don't pay attention to the pace, that will never be a oneer. It will right. never make it. It will never get to the, to the screen as a oneer. Right. I think that is, is a, a big thing that editors are challenged with. Mm-hmm. Say that. Great word. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we love it. I love it. Love waters. I love, you know, like it is sometimes it's harder because you have to get in there and replace words in people's right. mouths and, you know, make it work, make, put all the, there's like five different takes, but you're mm-hmm. like, oh, take five. This word was better. So you're putting it in that person's mouth and put this on the back yeah. of somebody's head or doing, you know, like, you're 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 changing a lot within that one shot, continuous yeah. shot. But and make um, sure you got some a bailout place or you got like something, something else to, yes. that you can do that you and and creatively, even if it's just sound, even if it's you know off screen something happening. But mm-hmm. uh, I will, I, I you know I think most directors get you know like wide shot, medium, medium, close up, close up. Like they, they can do that. I, I like stuff that feels continuous, you know, like you're including different angles in one shot. So it doesn't need to be cut so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the, you know, like the most important thing is just emotion and good, getting good performances. Like if it's, two close-ups and that's all you got but these two questions are 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 like the actors were on it and they everything was great but i'll take it i'll take it because right. that performance right. is king <laughs> but i i know like directors deal with a lot on set and and you have to navigate actors personalities and moves and things i you know, like one thing I will say that's a smaller thing is like, how are you going to do your inserts? You know, like you're going to mm-hmm. need them. And, you know, mm-hmm. people are always like, oh, I just went, well, so-and-so did that insert. And I'm like, no, work the insert into the, to the scene and, you know, make it feel like it's organic and not that you're like, cutting this right. on. <laughs> You know, and it's a, I, it's I a product I, placement or something. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I think people that, that, directors that think about an organic way to do what somebody is being because that's mm-hmm. essentially what an insert is like or I, I love it I love it and then I you know I I think music is really important and having a sense of, of what type of music you're it, it's going to play with it because that mm-hmm. will that will influence the pace of the scenes within the the, sh- the the cut, like you know, because like when I'm talking about pace on set for a director, it's within the cuts. It's not, you know, like right. I can pace it up or pace it back, but that I can't make something that's not there. You right. know, like so, I you know, if I I tend to see that directors rush through or they let their actors rush through a moment instead of like stepping through the emotions the way people do, you know, like 
I, you know, you want to see a moment of decision on somebody's face. Mm-hmm. You want to see, you want to see that's the, the, the minute they start crying, you want to see that on somebody's face. You, you can't cut to somebody and they're already like in it. Right. So right. all of and you think that's obvious, like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll get that. But when the actors rush through it, you have to slow them down. You have to say the audience needs to follow the emotion here. Like you already know what's happening. You read the script. You already know, but we don't know. So, and I can always make something faster. It's very hard to make it run. Right. And make right. it to, to slow it down. I feel like that's, that's like the num like one of the most frequent directions I'm giving, which is, hey, can we can, let's get a, a longer beat right here? Mm-hmm. You know, just something to, again, have that certainty of what's happening in this moment or have the uncomfortableness of being with someone in a moment that they'd rather be left alone, you mm-hmm. know, because now mm-hmm. we're, now we're watching something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, mean, I do think bad habits get developed by the speed through which a lot of TV is made. And also like, and now this might make some people mad, but one of the, one of my least favorite notes to give an actor is tell them to throw it away Mm -hmm. because it's like, well, what? I don't throw away anything in my day, Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. if it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there ain't Mm -hmm. ain't nothing I've ever done I've thrown away. And, and if it's, if it's, if it can be thrown away, then what matters? Yeah. You know, yeah. so, so yeah. some of these things are of lesser importance than, well, what, what am I doing? You know, that's yeah. personally yeah. that feat, but. Well, if you're, or if you're, if you're throwing it away, where is it going to come back? Mm-hmm. Where does it come back? And like, oh shit, like, you know, like, and then things aren't structured. Normally it, it, the moment is the moment and when it, and it passes, but there is something to be said for, a scene that's fast and then a scene that's slow and then a scene that, you know, like the dynamic, even the dynamic of dialogue. Like mm-hmm. if, if that thing is being thrown away or, it, I, and I'm, I'm assuming you mean like the acting style is like, make it feel natural and off the cuff. So yes. that it doesn't feel like it's written and read, which yes. obviously that's what you always want. You want it to feel organic to the character. But it's hard. I think it's hard for actors to, you know, good actors can do it. Like they make it seem like right. this, this is them. Like you meet them and you're like, wait, you're not like this at all. And, that, and right. that's, that's because they're just, they're just really good at what they do. But if people are struggling and it sounds red and it sounds, you know, staccato or whatever, and, and, and they're given that note, yeah, it it, it it ends up feeling a missed, feeling like a missed beat, mm-hmm. especially if it's a beat that is in the script. Mm-hmm. Like, if it's in that script, you got it. <laughs> like you, it's got, you got to get it. It may not end up in the final product, but right. at least you got to start with what right. is, all the beats, all the underlying beats, all the, you know, like when I read a script, I'm, I'm reading it on level. I'm reading intention of lines and all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. Like I'm, I'm putting that into it because it's, I'm coming from where I'm coming from, especially if it's something, you know, with black women or black people or, you know, like I'm bringing all that into the intention. And I have to be careful too, because sometimes they're like, oh no, that wasn't, no, that wasn't what we intended. And I'm like, yeah, but it's layers to it. Like <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't getting deep <laughs> enough. Like there's stuff going on here. Um, yeah. Because I I felt it, it's in there, right? But you know, a lot of times it's like it it, it has to be simplified mm-hmm. before it can be developed. So right. you got to get the simple stuff, and then as you work through the process, you can be like, but I, you know, I think there's something here that's a little bit more than what was just the line. Right. Uh, and then that's how that's what you that's when you edit. You edit, you know, like reactions and looks and pauses and and you know twitches of the face and all like I'm really like I'm an eye editor like I'm looking yeah. at people's eyes I'm looking at people looking at each other like mm-hmm. it always has to connect for me through the eyes yeah but, yeah yeah these are gems these are gems what, <laughs> what's the so what's the future look like right because you you are 
successfully able to kind of in the last several years do feature films and do narrative series, right? What do you, and now you're working on this Marvel thing that we'll know at some time in the near future. <laughs> but like, do you want to keep going between mediums? Like what's your, what's your kind of. Yeah. Hope yeah. I mean, uh, as far as editing, I, I love doing features and I love doing pilots and limited series mm-hmm. uh, because I'm just, I'm of that, like create, like create the first thing, you know, create, I, I love that process of like figuring out what the show is or what the, the movie is. Right. And, you know, like I'll totally like, I love working with the same sorts of people, the same people that I've worked with. I, you know, mm-hmm. I want to work with them again. So whatever they're doing, that's what mm-hmm. I'll be doing. And, and then I, I, I've started writing. So I'm looking into, you know, maybe transitioning into writing or, you know, writing features. And I love it. Yeah. Creating. Cause I, I just, I've, been rewriting and editing for so long and you know I just had like all these ideas and that pop up and you know I'll be like midnight and I'll just start writing stuff and Mm -hmm. so I've actually I really enjoy it I've gotten into it a lot that's awesome last two questions what would you tell your younger self with all the information and experience you've gained what would you tell that young woman who was graduated yeah. Howard, what her life might look like or, or some principles that she should try and live live by. I feel like I learned in my 30s is like, don't worry about what other people are doing. Do what you do. You know, like you go through a time period where you are trying to do things with other people. And it's like, you know, like, kind of like, you know, Harry Tubman, you know, like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, oh, I can take y'all with me. But if you act up, like, I got to leave you behind. Like, and I would tell my younger self, like, to learn earlier that, like, not everybody is going to have the same goals as you, have the same work ethic as you, or, you know, like, don't let that impede what you know you need to do. Right. That's just a general, like, in life to, you know, like, you're, you're, you, and I have, you know, I'm an eight-year-old daughter, so she, of course, wants to do what her friends are doing. And right. so you have to go, you have to get through that, that period of time where you're like, you know, it, if it's not for me, it's not for me. Like, I need to do what I got to do. And there's all different types of people, all different levels of intelligence and, and like I said, work ethic and, and perseverance and, and just like personality traits and stuff. You just, you can't, you, you can't chase after other people. You have to, you have to make sure you do what you need to do instinctively, what you know you need to do. And is there anything I haven't asked you, you know, that you might want to share or add (laughs) or expound on, you know, in, in the editor's cut here? Yeah, um, no, we, you know, we, you, you have a, a child. And so yeah. we didn't talk about like having children in this industry and, mm. and how that's another element of busy, you know, yeah. like you're, you're constantly trying to like balance on. And I, I literally don't balance it. Like there is no balance. There is time periods where you yeah. are a great, partner and 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 mother or father and then there's top peers where you are a great artist and creative and and hopefully right. you're switching between the two at a at a regular pace. yeah i might i might offer and maybe this is my my rose colored way of viewing it but mm-hmm. i feel like because there's stages of development and mm-hmm. there are moments where we come to appreciate, like even ourselves later in life, things that our parents did or or maybe we don't appreciate, but we understand. Yeah. And I, and I feel like I want to be, like I have a book and I'm like, I feel like really proud of the fact that she will read that book yeah. and, and read the inscription that I wrote to her Aww. when she was born and be able to be like, 
I understand who my dad is, was, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think that like you change and you, in how you choose your jobs, you know, yeah. you choose for sometimes location. Like I've been yeah. doing that in the last year, but yeah. you also choose by, or I also choose by, I want to be able to explain like why this one was important and I did it yeah. and, and the reasons why I was gone for three months on that thing. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't want you to think that you have to shrink your dreams or your world. You know, you have to be reasonable and find that balance, yeah. but you also yeah. have to be true to yourself. And if, yeah. if we don't do that, then yeah. you'll never learn. Yeah. That, yeah. You know? yeah. So it's yeah. this weird, it's not weird. It's just the, it's the challenge of like what, what seems, you know, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but what's easily yeah. understood and what's, and what's, yeah learned to be appreciated you know but it's mm -hmm. like, it's a real it's a real it's a real thing yeah know, a, well and then also we we work in an amazing industry that like goes around the world and and you know I, I think our generation is or you know like coming generation that there is something there that will last forever just like you said there's not a lot of jobs where that, where you get that or, True. you know, like I don't, you know, accountants, people all around the world don't see their work or, mm -hmm. you know, like they feel it <laughs> when right. tax season comes or whatever. But yeah, I think we just, we get to work in an amazing job. And yeah. I love it. Well, I, I, you know, I'm so happy our paths crossed yeah. and I, I mean, I believe you were like the first editor of any episodic thing I ever directed. You I, know? I believe I was too. You had directed like the show within the show on Insecure. Yeah. 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 That was amazing because <laughs> I, I was the assistant and I had edited that. Did there you, know you go. That? I did not know that. No, I did, I did not I know did. that. I had edited that. I was the, an assistant on the first season of Insecure. Okay. And so I had edited, because you did the first season, right? No, I did. I did. I, so I, I couldn't, I, they, I didn't get hired for season two, but I kind of got that as like a, well, let's yeah. see what he can do. And then, uh, yeah. uh, and then I, I got a season three episode. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, so maybe I didn't, I did not edit yours, but I did on the first season, I cut the, sh the show that was going on within the show. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. uh, and so then when you came in, I was like, oh, my God, you did that. Oh, that's so great. So, but yeah, yeah I think I did your first full first episode. ever. Yeah, man. And it was great. It's, it was great. It and then was, remember you did you ended up doing two, right? Mm -hmm. You came yeah. back and do another one. The, came back like, for the finale. one, 12. Yeah. I, did, I think me and uh, Capel, we were the only two that came back in season one. I came back. I did five and 12. And I think he did like whatever number and, and yeah. the finale. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, nah, and it was, it, it's really cool hearing all of this too, because, and that's one of my joys about getting to talk to people I know where it's like, you know, whether it's like somebody that I'm getting to know more or like, you know, I've talked to friends. I'm like, yo, I didn't know that shit about you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but like, it's, it's, it's cool because like at the time when we were doing this thing, which was very early for both of us, I did not get the sense of how uh, of it being a beginning kind of stage for you in that in that position yeah, yeah you know? it, it was it was my well it was my third show but yeah no I I I because I had done the quad and then oh was it my second show I don't remember no I did the quad then I did queen sugar then I did grownish so it was my third show it was my first half hour comedy mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we were like looking me and Jamie, we had 13 episodes every four days. We had a new episode come in. And like, that was the, the fastest I had ever moved in my entire life. <laughs> but yeah, it was good. It was good for, it was, it was great. And then, you know, being in the room with Kenya and, you know, he he's just like a creative, like mm -hmm. a writer's writer. So mm -hmm. you know, it's just a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Kenya. Saw him yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah. Nah, this is awesome. Well, Shannon, thank you. It's been a pleasure having you on the pod. Yay. And I look forward to learning what this Marvel show is. Okay. Well. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on Facebook on our Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman official page and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C H A T M O N. All right. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Shannon Baker Davis. Our next episode, episode 44, will be uh, a special one, one that we've never done before and uh, one that I hope you tune in for. But it's going to be uh, it's going to be something special. So we'll see how you react. I'm not even going to tease it. Uh, you're going to have to press play on that TV show without knowing what it's about. So um, as always, y'all stay safe, spread love and keep creating. And uh, I will catch you next week. Peace.